Welcome back. Today we're going to go to the conclusion of our cancer lectures and talk about treatment. Now these include our biggest tools against cancer, our surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy. First I want to show you the Loeb's Rules of Therapeutics. These were made by Dr. Robert Loeb, who is the Bard Professor of Medicine at Columbia University's College of Physicians and Surgeons, and I suppose barbers. And Dr. Loeb said, if what you are doing is doing good, keep doing it. If what you're doing is not doing good, stop doing it. If you don't know what you're doing, do nothing, and never make the treatment worse than the disease. Now, this was real genius. Uh, there's also the first law of medicine that everybody's supposed to know, primum noli nocere, above all, do no harm. And then one that's not up there, my personal favorite, is just make sure you remember that the patient is the one with the disease. So let's talk about surgery first. Uh, surgery has always been the first line of treatment for almost all cancers and actually remains so today, even though it's the most barbaric thing we can do, it's the most invasive, and yet it still has a place, unfortunately, in, in the treatment of cancer, and it takes the prime position. Because surgery is the tool with which we can remove the bulk of the tumor most easily. We can get rid of that primary mass, and this, as I said, is going to have the oldest and most aggressive cells in the clone. So we need to get rid of it. It's a very important adjunct also to staging. Let me just show you a comparative slide that we'll go back to several times. But the, the, the good thing about surgery is it removes the whole mass whenever possible, and it is instant debulking. We call that debulking because we want to get rid of the, the majority of the tumor cells even when we can't get rid of all of them because our other modalities, radiation and chemotherapy, don't do as well. And it is tumoricidal, unlike uh, anti-angiogenesis therapy. This basically kills the tumor cells by taking them out. The problem is it requires a target. We have to know where the tumor is. We may know where the primary is, but obviously it might not be so good on an occult metastasis, one we can't see. So we need to be able to target. It's very invasive. It's the most invasive you can be is to invade someone's body with a knife. And we don't get control of the microscopic margin. So this is important. When we take out a cancer, it's very important that we leave no tumor cells behind at the edges of our resection. Now, the way we do this is we try to go in and take normal tissue around the tumor as much as we can without causing destruction. So in certain areas, it's going to be easier than others. For example, in the breast, we can usually take an area of normal breast tissue around it. Um, whereas in the brain, you have almost no leeway at all. Everything you take out would be destructive. It's also important for us to have that margin because then what the pathologist can do, again, using breast as an example, he can take that tumor mass with the normal tissue and roll it in India ink. And then when he cuts it under the slide, he can make sure that there's no tumor cells into the area of India ink, which would be the outermost perimeter uh, of our excision. And we can do other things to help him. We can, for example, put markers on the top and the right and the left and the bottom of the tumor. So when the pathologist comes back and says, you know, you're really too close on your top uh, or your one o'clock position, uh, then we can go back to that position in the patient and take a little more if we have to. So surgery is really important in debulking. It's really also very important in what we call staging. In the staging of tumors, we are looking for the anatomic extent of the tumor. Purely anatomic. What we want to do is stage the patients, and we put them in, in stages Roman numerals 1 through 4, and this determines further treatment. Gives us an idea about prognosis. And we can also compare series of treatments, so I can know how my patients who are stage 2 do with whatever modalities I use to treatment, treat them compared to, let's say, Dr. Bonadonna in Italy, who is doing hit, uh, work at the Tumor Institute in Milan, he and I are going to be talking the same language. We both know what stage two means. What we do in staging is we look for the, t it's a TNM staging. We look for the tumor size. 
We look for the presence or absence of metastases in the regional nodes. So in the breast, those would be the nodes mostly under the arm. And then we also look for distant metastases, which are different. And we number them from one to four. Local disease with no nodes or mets uh, are stage one. Distant metastases are stage four. And there are two more in the middle that vary from tumor to tumor. We have different staging methods to specialize uh, the way we do it. We also have something called histologic grading. This is something else the surgeon helps do. We number this one to four usually, from best to worst. And the pathologist does this by looking under the microscope. And it's very consistent. If you ask 20 pathologists to stage, I'm sorry, to grade a certain tumor, they'll be very close in their approximation. We look at how much differentiation the cells have. You remember that the anaplastic ones do very poorly. Well differentiated ones are more like the normal tissue, so they do better. We look at cellular pleomorphism. We've used that term before. Cells that are all different sizes and shapes are not as good as a consistent size. Nuclear grade, again, how ugly the nuclei look. Number of mitoses. Mitoses are actually seeing the cells divide. You can see the chromosomes line up like that on a slide. And we count the number of them. The more divisions, the more aggressive. Lymphatic invasion, of course, is bad. Vascular, we just talked about. And we have a machine that can pick out one, slide, one cell in 100,000 at rapid speeds, 1,000 per second, and tell us, do they have ploidy, the right number of chromosomes, or crazy numbers? S phase, are they synthesizing DNA? The more DNA they're synthesizing, the worse it is. Worse it is because that's what cancer does. How much DNA? Cancer has a lot of DNA and usually bad DNA. And then specific gene expression uh, markers that tell us aggressiveness. So between staging and grading, we get a very good idea. Now, as you can see, grading is not anatomic. Grading is biologic. We're looking at markers that tell us the biology of this patient. So for example, in breast cancer, we had three operations we used to do. Dr. Halstead, who was very, very famous. He was the professor of surgery at Johns Hopkins. He invented just about everything. I tell my students, if you don't know the answer to a surgical history quiz, say Halstead. He invented rubber gloves for his girlfriend who was allergic. Uh, she was the nurse and allergic to the disinfectant. He invented three kinds of hernia repairs, mastectomy. He also invented the residency training system in America for training surgeons instead of using a, a, pro, a, pro, a preceptorship. He also invented the radical mastectomy because he thought you needed an en bloc dissection. So through an incision like this, the entire breast was removed. All the pectoral muscles were removed because he thought it spread through the pectoral muscles often, which it does not. And then an en bloc dissection of all the lymph nodes. In about the 1960s, people decided that really was too much surgery and unnecessary, and we started removing the entire breast but leaving the pectoral muscles, leaving much better function. And finally, after that, we moved into just doing what is now called lumpectomy, where the tumor is removed with that little margin of normal tissue. And then through a separate incision, we used to take out all those lymph nodes again, and now we do what's called a sentinel node biopsy. We inject either dye here before the operation begins or during the operation or radioactive material that will, in a period of a few minutes, get picked up by the lymphatics and deposited in these lymph nodes. Then we open up the axilla, the armpit, and we use a Geiger counter and or our own eyes to look for the blue dye and find the lowest lymph node. We call that the sentinel node. We take it out and we see if it contains metastases. It's unusual for these metastases to skip lymph nodes. So if that's clean, we figure they're all clean. And if that has tumor cell in it, we know it's already spread. Unlike Halstead, we no longer believe you have to take them all out. This is really just part of the staging procedure.
So in order to see if this really worked, the National Surgical Adjuvant Breast Protocols were started way back about three decades ago. They were double-blind studies, they were randomized, and they were prospective. We found that lumpectomy with axillary dissection worked every bit as well as the modified radical mastectomy, which worked every bit as well as the radical mastectomy by Halstead, and now the lumpectomy with axillary dissection is the gold standard. That's really all I'm going to tell you about surgical treatment. Basically, we would like to do less and less to patients in a surgical way, but so far we haven't moved off that position of needing to do surgery in a lot of cases. The next kind of uh, treatment we give patients is radiation. In this case, we use high energy coming out of a radiation generator um, to create uh, a, a release of energy within the patient's DNA. Now, if you look at this chart, here again is what the radiation is going to do compared to surgery and compared to chemotherapy later. It's going to give us excellent control of those microscopic margins because we're going to aim it in the area the primary tumor was removed but it's going to have a wider spectrum and it doesn't have to see where those scattered cancer cells are. It's very non-invasive, it has very few side effects of a serious nature, and it does kill cells eventually. The problem is you still need a target, just like the surgeon. We have to know where we're aiming it. You cannot radiate the whole body, um, and you only get one lifetime anatomic dose. Once you have full therapeutic radiation. Now, this is not diagnostic x-rays. This is full therapeutic radiation. You can never again give it, no matter how many years later. You've done enough damage to the blood vessels that if you radiate again in that area, probably you'll cause necrosis and death of any of the tissue you radiate. And today, for example, if you radiate the breast, the patient gets a tiny little tattoo at each edge of where they've been radiated. So 30 years later, if you have to radiate something else in that area, you know not to cross the line. And radiation doesn't handle bulk very well. It needs a small amount of tumor cells, unlike uh, surgery, so it might be a good complement to surgery. Surgery handles the margins poorly. Radiation handles them well. Surgery does, uh, radiation doesn't handle bulk well, but surgery does. The way radiation works is if you can imagine a hammer and an anvil and a spark. You strike the hammer, that's the radiation coming out of our gun, our radiation gun. And the anvil is the tumor itself. The tumor is serving as the anvil and it generates the spark, which is the energy being released in the target. So in radiation, when we measure radiation doses, we really don't measure what's coming out of the gun. We're really interested in what strikes the target. That's all that counts. We don't care what's coming out of the muzzle. We care what's hitting the target. And we measure these in what are called, for decades have been called RADs, which is a, so, many, uh, it, it's so many joules per kilogram. It's an energy measurement. And then later on, they honored the founder of dosimetry, the man who measured the dose, and they've changed this name to gray. So 5,000 rad is now equal to 50 gray. It's 100 to 1. And if you really want to sound cool when you talk to your doctor, you talk about a dose in gray, and, and they'll really wonder where you got that information. Um, the primary lethal event here is the injury to the DNA. What happens in these cases is that here's a, a, a picture of DNA. This is an X radiation, and here's some higher voltage radiation. This is kili electron volts. And the, the wavelength is such that the X ray, for example, can cause a break in the a DNA chain here. And as you go up, you can cause more breaks until you do a great deal of damage. The idea, however, is not to fry this cell. Because if you're going to shoot, you're going to fry cells, then you're going to fry all the cells that your radiation goes, th goes through. We can boost up the dosage and really nail the tissue, but then you're going to destroy the whole purpose, which is to get through the normal tissue and, tissue and just hit the cells you're after. 
what we're looking for here, the definition, the, the radiobiologic definition of death here is to lose reproductive ability. We want this cell not to die because you've boiled it up like an egg, but we want to make it so that when it tries to reproduce, it just can't. And that may take several cell divisions before it falls apart, and that's why radiation may take so long to see a result. These bad cells have to go through a certain number of attempts at replication before they finally die. And what we're doing is we're making use of the fact that because you're injuring DNA and because you're injuring replication, you're also making it so that the radiation event um, is being felt most in replicating cells, and that's your cancer cells. Most of our cells are resting. They're not replicating. They're not going to feel this effect. So we're using selective, um, selective dosages to get the cells that are going to be hurt by the same dose the most. Um, the dosage you'll hear, by the way, as I said, it's about 5,000 rad or 50 gray to a specific area, for example, the whole breast. If you want to compare that with diagnostic radiation, um, an x-ray or a mammogram would be about one rad. And we actually don't measure it that way. In the x-rays, we care what's coming out of the gun. We don't measure what hits the target because we want all our x-rays to go through the patient, come out the other side, and hit the x-ray plate. So we measure our doses, dosages, and we call them something else. Uh, but basically, it's different, and it's a much lower magnitude. It's a bit of a problem because low-dosage radiation can damage cells enough to mutate them, and that's the radiation carcinogenesis that I was talking about in the earlier lecture, saying that we get injury to a cell, we cause mutation, but we don't kill it. If we kill it, it isn't a problem. Whereas radiation therapy is more likely to kill the cells and even less likely than casual radiation to create further tumors down the road because we're going to kill everybody that might be in a position to become a cancer cell. There are radiation induced tumors after radiation therapy, but not nearly as many uh, as you get from other sources of radiation. Let me show you another method, and we call this tangential beam. This is called the linear accelerator. This is one of the most important machines in radiation therapy these days. And what it does is it spins the electrons into a very fast state and then fires them out. We used to use um, cobalt, and we'd basically put it in a brownie box camera that was uh, made of lead, and we would open the shutter, and then the radiation would come out the shutter, and we would close it. It gave us a lot of radiation, but it was slow-moving radiation that injured the skin a lot, so it did not spare the skin. And it also didn't have a very fine, precise line of demarcation. So when we irradiate a small spot, for example, in the breast, we would radiate a lot of tissue around that we didn't want to radiate. Uh, it was like using a shotgun instead of a rifle. It did a lot of damage, but often places we didn't want it to damage. The linear accelerator gives us much higher voltages. And the beauty of the higher voltages is what we call forward-moving radiation, that tends to spare the skin as it goes through and gets more radiation into the target. And then we use something really very cool called tangential beam. And what you see is what's really happening. This huge, huge machine is moving around here in a steady arc. The patient is getting radiation, looks like, on her head here. And this laser beam is marking the radiation field. And there is a computer that's linked to the linear accelerator. And they do something called a, uh, a, well, it's a trial run, really, in the beginning. It's called a simulation. The first days of the radiation, they set up the patient in a mold, so the patient is always in the same position every time for treatment. And then they let the computer decide how to deliver the dose. And what the, the uh, linear accelerator is actually doing, if this is the patient on the table, with the skin on the outside and the tumor on the inside, the linear accelerator is shooting as it moves across in an arc. And one beam of photons or electrons is going through the patient, striking the skin there, striking the tumor, and moving on out. And at every few 
seconds that the next beam is moving, it's striking a different place on the skin, it's striking different internal tissues, and it's focusing on the tumor. So when you're giving this huge dose, you're really sparing all the other places, and the tangential beam is just hitting the tumor exactly where you want it to go. So again, this we do need a target here, but it's a very good adjunct to use along with um, surgery. Let's move on to chemotherapy and talk about, about its pros and cons too. Now, chemotherapy finally moves us away into an area where uh, we have a few problems that are solved. We give these drugs mostly intravenously. So as you know, within seven seconds, it's going to get to virtually every cell in the body. We have to calculate the dose, but we're going to get it to everywhere, including the tumor cells, but also including our resting cells. Now, the thing about chemotherapy is we don't need a target. This is the beauty. This is why it's become so important in metastatic disease. We don't have to know where these cells are hiding. It will get there without us. It's excellent for micrometastases, for the little teeny ones with just a few cells, maybe a few hundred thousand cells, that's a little bit, in the patient. We have no idea where they are, and it's going to be very effective against those. However, it's very systemically toxic, and it is no good at all, really, for handling bulk. It doesn't get in where it needs to, and it won't do the job. So again, it does things that radiation and surgery don't do in that it requires no target, but it handles bulk poorly, so we use surgery to take care of that, and it is systemically toxic. There's a couple of things about chemotherapy um, that you need to know about. There's something called the, the Goldie-Coldman hypothesis. This is a huge mathematical concept, and I have no idea what it means. I cannot tell you or put it up on that slide to explain it to you, but what doctors Goldie and Coldman found out was that chemotherapy will fail even in very small uh, numbers of cells unless you go the whole way using all the chemotherapy and get all the possible metastatic cells that may have some resistance. And you cannot back off and get the same result. If you're getting a bad result in surgery, you can always stop the surgery. If you get a bad result in radiation, you can back off, let the patient rest, and pick up again. In chemotherapy, if you don't finish the course of chemotherapy because of toxicity, then the patient is very likely to have a lot of resistant cells that escape through natural selection because they haven't been killed. And you'll get the most resistant cells. They also say that it's very unlikely you're going to be able to do the job with one drug. We usually, for most cancers, don't use one drug. We use multiple drugs so that we can lower the toxicity of each drug, trying to get drugs that have different toxicities. One that works maybe depressing the bone marrow is a bad thing. You get another drug that doesn't, has another toxicity, and you may get a synergistic or summation effect on killing the cells you want to kill and not make the patient so sick. So ideally, you'd like to use eight or ten drugs. We generally use two or three and try to get the patient to complete the whole cycle. And then what we do is give it in cycle, so just about the time when things are getting really bad for the patient, you back off and then pick up again later. And these cycles are timed to try to get the cells when, when the cells have just caught their breath and are starting to multiply again, you nail them again. Meanwhile, normal cells have probably recovered pretty well, whereas the tumor cells, which are kind of not normal cells, may not get that chance to bounce back as quickly. Um, it's very hard to measure the responses unless you have some tumor you can see. And this gets us into the kinds of chemotherapy we can give. And the most important one is a category called adjuvant chemotherapy. Adjuvant chemotherapy has a very specific definition. It means that it is given to a patient in whom we cannot prove that they have metastases, but we highly suspect it. Because what we found out is that if you wait until there are enough tumor cells to produce symptoms and let us make the diagnosis, then 
it's usually too late to get a, the best result from the chemotherapy. The patient will have too many cells and the chemotherapy is going to fail. If you move in um, to a patient who has microscopic metastases, they're going to get the best result, but how do we know who that patient is? So adjuvant chemotherapy, therefore, is defined as a chemotherapy given to the patient without proven metastases, but who we think has a very high likelihood of having those metastases. The example is best in breast cancer. We have patients who are, for example, stage one. Now, as you remember from our staging, these are patients who have had biopsies. Staging really is done at the time of surgery and it doesn't really change. These are the patients who have a small tumor, usually less in this case than two centimeters, so less than an inch. We have biopsied their lymph nodes and we know they have no regional metastases. So it hasn't even gotten to the axilla, the armpit, and we can't find any distant metastases. So we have done scans and blood tests and x-ray. We've done everything we can at this point. We've taken the tissue out. We've examined the lymph nodes. We're at the perioperative period of treatment. And this patient now has gotten all the information we're going to get for us and from her about the nature of her cancer. If we just treated her with surgery, and we also, by the way, radiate the local area in the breast because we can reduce recurrence there, local recurrence, from about 30% without radiation to less than 5% with radiation. So they get a little local radiation, but they don't get any chemo normally. One would expect the survival rate for those stage one patients to be 100%. You should cure everyone. And in fact, it's not. If you look at all the patients who are stage one, and this is clinical staging, we don't care about the real stage because we can't get to the real stage until we have an autopsy. We have to do something before we get to the autopsy, and we have to compare our results with our colleagues on how we treat that stage at the time of surgery. So from everything we know, she was a stage one, but 15% of those patients are going to come up with metastases later. They were actually stage four, weren't they? They were in this group that had distant metastases. We just didn't know it. We weren't smart enough to find out. We would love to know who they are because we would love to give them adjuvant chemotherapy. A couple of decades ago, we actually wouldn't treat any of them because we didn't want to treat 85 patients unnecessarily just to cure those 15. We'd rather wait till they show up and go after them. In stage two, and stage two patients here have a slightly bigger tumor, but the main thing is they have positive regional nodes. It has spread no matter what the size. And they, again, have no distant metastases that we can see. But because they have these nodes, they become suspect. And indeed, if we don't treat them, about 60% are going to be cured, but 40% now will turn up to be stage four. So it has always been our custom to not treat stage one and go ahead and use adjuvant therapy. We can't prove they've got METs, but there's such a high risk that we decide to treat everybody so we can help the 40%, okay? If we go back now and look at the, some of the things we can do, we can now, which we couldn't do 30 years ago, get all this information in the grading. We can add this to the staging. And what we can do for these patients is we can see, is this very anaplastic? Is there lots of pleomorphism? Are there numerous mitoses? And are all these parameters measurable and looking bad? We can say to that patient, look, you're a stage one. It's likely that you're cured, but we've got a lot of bad biologic markers. We would do you a lot of good if we would do the chemotherapy now before this comes back three years down the road. And we can select, maybe find that 15% of the whole group of stage ones who would really benefit from the chemotherapy. Now that ends chemotherapy as a subject. We are also intervening now in many new ways, not in immunotherapy against cancer cells. It hasn't been that successful. However, we're intervening in individual steps 
some of those steps with the growth factors that I showed you earlier. For example, uh, there is a growth factor called HER, HER2. And if patients express that growth factor, we now have an antibody, a monoclonal antibody, which we can inject and block the HER2 and stop these patients from having their tumor grow out of control and in many cases even cure them. We're experimenting with lots of these new biologic uh, factors to protect patients against metastases. And this is probably the biggest area of exploration and improvement in the treatment of cancer. Next time we'll come back and we'll look at how patients heal.